Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. What's up, family? I'm Tommy. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Tommy. Uh, so, I got sober January 10th, 2010. So about ten, you know, ten years ago this time, I was, I was uh, pretty deep in a, into a, a six month bender where I was trying to drink like a, a gentleman. I was trying to uh, do like someone from the program suggested and only have two uh, a night, and that would be, you know, the first night it was four, the next night it was eight, and then like. I just got frustrated with counting. Um, so, but like, uh, you know, I got sober when I was 26, um, but I met Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 23. I came in the rooms, kind of got a feel for what was going on, wasn't really feeling it. So, I kept coming back uh, just because I had kind of limited amount of places I could go in the first place. Um, but, uh, and it would probably save my life then, just because at that point, um, when I first came to AA, I was just drinking a case of beer a night, and I wasn't eating during the day, just because I was like, oh, I'm a cheap date, you know? Um, I would, I would, I would make sure that I could, like, um, get what I needed from that, the moment I wake up, you know, whether it's... Uh, whatever I needed to like keep myself level or keep myself comfortable, and I and I knew what I enjoyed, and um, um, you know by the time I I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had a bit of the shakes and stuff like that, a bit of uh, um, alcohol withdrawal, and so like luckily I didn't stop drinking at that point. I probably would have uh, gone into like DTs or something like that, but. Um, they kind of, uh, gave me some new ideas uh, about my drinking with respect to, uh, um, you know, I, I, I had a misconception of what AA was because, uh, I'm like third generation AA in my family. So I kind of like saw other people doing AA and I was like, oh man. That's AA, I don't want anything to do with it. And then I came to AA, and I was like, yeah, I definitely don't want anything to do with it. Um, but, um, you know, uh, three years of drinking and trying to stop drinking on my own um, uh, after being introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous, the, the seed was planted. But going back to when I started drinking when I was a kid, I, uh, you know, drinking was like the solution to all my problems, you know, it was like, it was just like my, my character defects, if you will, you know, my character defects are like my survival tools that weren't really good at building anything in my life, they were good at getting me what I wanted or tearing stuff to pieces, and, you know, destruction is great and all, but like, uh, ultimately, you know, I needed some kind of structure in my life, and I didn't know where to to go to get it. And that's where later in my in my story, you know, when Alcoholics Anonymous gave me a little bit of good orderly direction to follow, and gave me you know structure that I never had to allow me to like recover these things that I never had in the first place. You know, um, yeah, I I, uh, I found it really useful to have a sponsor and and to uh, have somebody accountable to me and for me to be accountable to someone, you know, uh, uh, you know, the first three years when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I, I didn't want to make too close of friends with anybody. I, I really like showed up late, left early, kind of avoided when people crowded me. You know, it's kind of weird when a bunch of people are like, Oh, I want to like, get to know you and, or, and help you out. And like, what do you want from me? You know, uh, you know, so still to this day, I, I still have to like 
make an effort to like be nice to other people and, and talk to you know get to know the people around me in, in the in the meetings you know ha- have the meeting before the meeting have the meeting after the meeting you know, fellowship um, I'm lucky that I have like the the people in my life today you know I've done like amazing things in in my sobriety that I I never thought possible during drinking you know I gave up on a lot of dreams and then I uh, I got square with a lot of those dreams that I was like oh I don't really want that anymore you know so um, um, that definitely helps me not like struggle with what I think my life should look like because Alcoholics Anonymous kind of kind of has given me that good early direction so that I can keep my life in a day at a time kind of basis to where I don't get like overstretched and where I think I need to be at this very moment. You know, I can just sit in this chair, turn off my brain, get comfortable, and hopefully pick up something from a meeting. And, and it was really cool to, like, come in here and um, have the opportunity to to just, like, reinvest this, this moment and recollecting what it was like, what happened and what it's like now, you know, because what it was like was fucking shit, you know? If... If drinking was successful for me, and I, and I, you know, it was fun enough. If if I could do it successfully, I wouldn't be here. But um, I'm glad that like uh, I lived through the trauma of alcoholism. I lived through all the the uh, the depression of, of of just that existence, and and the continuance of of that same kind of like dis ease that I feel that I felt before the drink, and I felt after the drink. You know, it's it's those conditions that drove me to the drink and uh, where I am conditioned to thinking that that's a solution. But luckily, Alcoholics Anonymous has trained my feet to, to do the next right action to where I can live in that 24-hour period where I can be relatively comfortable in, in my own skin I can, uh, I can take fear and pain and not react to them. Um, you know, I, I've dealt with death a lot differently in sobriety than I did before. You know, before when, when that stuff would, uh, you know, when, when disease and death uh, came into my life, I, I, I used to drink at that stuff. And now... I see that stuff and I'm like, well, you know, that's life on life's terms. And and right now, I don't have to figure it all out. I just have to be present with whatever the experience is at, the, at that given time, you know. Um, working the steps, uh, giving me um, that good orderly direction that, you know, it started with the gift of desperation, that first step uh, enabling me to, like, you know, really call myself an alcoholic, and you know, you know, the, I came to believe that a power greater than myself, that group of drunks, would give me that like that power I need to to you know grow or die. You know, it's just simply put, you know, I can I can have that that good orderly direction. You know, I can come to terms with what I consider God is. You know, the, the great outdoors or like whatever. You know, like, I, uh, I'm amazed with how far I've come, you know. I, I grew up in South Carolina. I thought I was born and stuck um, until I got sober and I was able to, like, get the fuck out of there, you know. Um, you know, and I, I got sober there and I stayed sober moving here and I'm much, much happier with the sobriety and everything around here. Cause, but my sponsor does the same here as they did back there. So, you know, I got to pray and meditate. For me, prayer is more of like a mission statement where I ask for that good or direction of inspire my thinking, especially divorcing is self-pity, dishonesty, self-will, self-seeking, and fear to inspire my thoughts, actions, decisions, and intuitions to help me to relax and take it easy, to free me from doubt and indecision. God, give me whatever I need to take care of any problems. You know, ask all these things that be of maximum service to God and my fellows. You know, that that's 
like the mission statement I, I try to say every day. I don't. More often than not, I don't, you know. But I, but I like definitely try to be of service to people, and I'm able to be of service, whereas 10 years ago, I, I couldn't even help myself. And I think that's kind of the, the main thing is because I was willing and able to help someone out with just uh, trying to stay sober, that enabled me to be more helpful in all aspects of my life. And I grew in that capacity, and I continue to grow in that capacity of just trying to be of service to other people, uh, even if it's just to be present for somebody. It's like just being here with you is is a pleasure. So I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Michael. Hey, Michael. Oh. You guys, ever, anybody here remember in high school when the uh, your teacher wasn't there and you'd have a substitute teacher and you got a little excited <laughs> because you might get out of class early? <laughs> well, that might be the case tonight because <laughs> I don't know that I have 40 minutes of entertainment. <laughs> Um, uh, and, in fact, you know, I'll, I'll, as, as Gil joked with me on the, on the way by, uh, he's like, all I have to do is tell the truth. Whether my story is entertaining or not, it doesn't matter, right? It's just, but, um, but that is a, you know, that is the challenge with the 40 minute speaker here because you've got to have a, you have, you've got to have a, a sober story and it's somewhat, you know, it's, it's Saturday night and, and I've always regretted trying to fill 40 minutes of, uh, of time with my story, but, um, you know, I, uh, there it is. I, I wanted to read something, and, and whenever I work with a new with a sponsee, you know, I start reading at the f very first uh, the forward of the um, first edition, and it says, "We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than one hundred men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body." And that shit gives me goosebumps. I fuck. I tear up right now. I tear up when I read it with a sponsee. Um, because I have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. You know, I was obsessed with taking a drink or doing a drug. And once I started, I couldn't stop and I didn't know where I would end up. And that's, that's my story from basically, you know, my first drink, I really don't know. But I was an altar boy in, 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 in grade school. Okay, Catholic altar boy. And, you know, I guess, I, I don't know, I wasn't a goody two-shoes, but I was a kid who actually got asked to be the older boy during funeral masses, which happened during school. So, and the awesome part about that is, is after mass, you had to fill the, 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 the wine, the cruet, I think it's called, with wine. Fill it, you know, and, and, and this happened quite a bit in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. So, at some point in time, I started drinking fairly early. And my first drug was 13 years old, okay, smoked pot, a year later started doing hard drugs, a couple years later I was addicted to hard drugs. And that's pretty much how my life ran up to the point where I was uh, 26, and my first introduction to Alcoholics Anonymous was in a 28-day rehab program because I couldn't stop doing cocaine. And... Uh, you know, was I an alcoholic? Well, by your, by the way you describe it, yeah, I blacked out. Didn't everybody black out when they drank? Because, I mean, that's just kind of part of the deal. Okay, sure, I'm an alcoholic. And then, um, but, you know, I really wanted to stop doing cocaine. And if you really got down to the crux of it, I wanted to stop spending my money on cocaine. <laughs> you know, I probably wouldn't have uh, checked into the rehab program if I hadn't run out of money and I was getting ready to get kicked out of my house and, and I'd already sold my car. You know, I was, I was running out of options to keep my drug habit going. So I did the rehab um, program. And, uh, you know, and I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous almost immediately. And, uh, and, and I heard the first person speak and I thought to myself, it's like, oh my God, you guys won't be able to wait until I tell my story. Because then you'll know why I did so many drugs and drank so much. You know, and then I heard someone else talk, and I read the book, and it talks about uh, a complete and incomprehensible demoralization. 
And I suffered from that on those mornings after I swore off not getting high the night before. You know, and they talked about, uh, um, how's it go? Uh, an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. But that, that describes me to a T. And there are, there are, even today, there are, there are times when I've got to realize that I am, I'm neither one of those, you know. My dad tried to teach me as a little kid that I'm no better than anybody else. And he'd pause and he'd say, and you're no worse than anyone else. And my dad wasn't in this program, but, you know, that's one of the few things that he taught me that I remember. Maybe I remember some other stuff, but that's one of them. And I can, I can see its point now, but it still didn't change those in, in, internal feelings I had that, you know, I was, you know, I'd take your inventory and then I'd be a piece of shit in the, in the next breath. But, so, fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous and got into service almost immediately, you know, and, and this is back in the day, this was 1986, and someone can do some math, I was, I was 26 years old, and I hate to say that I'm 60 because, like, you realize I'm an old guy. <laughs> and any shot at getting a date here tonight just went out the door. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, so, put some, put some time together. I did the steps, right? Worked the steps. And I, and, um, you know, one of the, one of the things, you know, t t Tommy mentioned, you know, a uh, uh, group of drunks, order, good orderly direction. You know, I, I'm, I'm lazy, and because the word God is ingrained in me, I typically, I just refer to my higher power as God. But it's certainly not the Catholicism, you know, fire and brimstone, um, uh, double door looking guy that I was, you know, raised to think about. Uh, and I have no idea who my higher power is. Um, I mean, just last night I prayed to Gaia that he would rain on Australia to help with those fires. I have no idea, you know, what what is out there that is far better, far more powerful than I am. But there's something something out there. And one of the key points on this is it's this made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the, the uh, care of God as we understood Him, right? And and if you're new. It doesn't have to be a collective we. It's how you understand him and we accept your God or your belief in a higher power. Okay? And what's cool about Alcoholics Anonymous is no one gets in here and says like, well, my God's better than your God. You know, it's, it, it, it's just, it's, it's, your, it's your higher power, you know. And, and it, he, she, it will help you stay sober if you ask for that help. I'm a firm believer in that. You know, and... and you know, the talks about making a fearless, searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. You know, I did that. There's a lot of apprehension uh, with, with doing that. It's just a homework assignment. That's all it is. And you're not graded on it because you're going to get an A. You did it, you know, and you can always do it again. In fact, I have done, I don't know, four, four steps and there's reasons why I've done more than one other than needing to. Um, and then, you know, and then I talk to someone about it. I talk to my sponsor. And, and, it, and it, it helps me understand who I am, okay, why I have those fears. Why, the, why did I think I was any, why was I better than you? And why did I feel like a piece of shit and you're so much better than me? It helps me understand those fears, okay? That's the best thing about the fourth step, fourth and fifth step, Okay. Then what comes out of that is uh, are my character defects. Um, you know, um, my I have a sponsor just call them character traits because they they're not necessarily defects. They've kept us alive for all these years. I think no one's passed out yet. So, um, uh, you know, the, our, our defects, our character traits, have kept us alive it, it, through our through our addictions. Okay, so they are they are they're helpful, but I can understand. Why I react in a certain way when, you know, I, I hate my buddy Steve because he makes so much more money than I do. Or, you know, it's, it's all a fear of not getting something or losing something that I already have. That's, that's my primary problem with my character defects. Okay. Um, made a list of all, pers all the people we've harmed. You know, my parents were right on the top of that list back in 1986. And in fact, 
I had about just over a year of sobriety, went home to Ohio and to make amends to my folks. And uh, uh, I got to make amends to my parents. I took, you know, it's it funny. Um, uh, talking with my dad and I said, you know, mom and dad, you know, I've had problems with drugs all my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I joined Alcoholics Anonymous. And my dad's initial reaction was, they don't ask you for money, do they? <laughs> he always thought someone was out to get him. Um, was he one of us? <clears throat> he never admitted it, but, you know, his kids certainly would. Um, but anyway, um, you know, he passed away a few months later in, uh, in 87. And I got to put a one-year chip in his casket. Okay. And... Um, you know, in, 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 in those, at that point in time, you know, a lot of good stuff happened, you know. Uh, besides being sober, I got married, and I got separated. Um, and I don't know that those are both good things, but, you know, in hindsight it is. Uh, but um, I stopped going to as many meetings, okay? And uh, I can remember going to a meeting... I don't know, it, 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 I might have had eight, nine years of sobriety, and I went to hear someone speak. It was a young girl, and she was relatively new in the program. And, uh, and I didn't listen for the similarities. Okay? And, and she spoke, like, I, go, I, don't, I don't need meetings. There's, I have nothing in common. I, you know, I'm staying sober fine without going to meetings. And I think you can... Spoiler alert, 86 isn't my sobriety date, 1986. Um, so, you know, I stayed dry for a number of years, and I was irritable, and I was a crotchety motherfucker, and, uh, and I started romantic, ro romanticizing the idea of a drink. You know, and early on when I was in, you know, early days of sobriety, you know, it, we we joke with ourselves like, oh, if I, I got I got sober in Palo Alto, and then like, oh, if, if I ever go out, I'm gonna go straight to East Palo Alto and get some heroin and, and shoot up. You know, all these grandiose ideas. If you know, if I'd stayed sober, I wouldn't. You know, I'd have thirty some years of sobriety, but that didn't happen. But anyway, I'm away on a business trip. I've been romanticizing the idea of a drink. I'm with a customer. We're at lunch. He's where I'm in Germany. He doesn't speak much English, and I cannot speak any German. And he's like, "Have a beer? No, thank you. Have a beer? No, thank you. Have a beer? Okay." <laughs> you know. And instead of shooting heroin, I, I go out of the program on a shandy. <laughs> That's beer and Seven Up mixed. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, Tim. <laughs> not, uh, not the, I'm badass, you know. Uh, so, hey, the sky didn't fall. Um, you know, the, uh, on, on the way home, I stopped at a, at a, at a, at a, I didn't go home right away, and I drank alcoholically that weekend. Not that I blacked out. But I needed to manage my drinking so that I could get back to the airport. I didn't drink the way I wanted to drink. And it, it, there's a couple types of alcoholic drinking. Whether, we, you know, we just drink like we want to and end up where we want. Or we try and control it and we become miserable. And I was certainly miserable. Okay? Sky didn't fall yet. Life went on. And, uh... uh you know, good things, bad things, got divorced, dated girls. I will I will back up a little bit. As I was going through my divorce, and I just come out of, I just jumped, got off the wagon. Uh, I, I, I went to a, into a pretty debaucherous phase. Um, drinking and fucking as, as often as I possibly could, okay? Not necessarily proud of it, but it's just, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, treated like a badge of honor for a while. And uh, then I met this girl and, and, and fell madly in love with her, and she and she moved in with me. 
and uh, uh, and, and and my drinking hadn't gone over the edge yet. Right? Uh, she moves out, and I realize that I can now drink at home. And things I started doing things that um, I'd never done before. Um, you know, I talk. You hear people who who hide bottles in their houses, right? I lived alone. <laughs> okay, you'd you'd hide bottles, and then and then you would you would you would take out the trash as quietly as possible, and you you know I, I had someone who would help who would come clean, come clean my place, and I would go empty all the liquor bottles before the the cleaning people would come. <laughs> I'm laughing here. There's, it says 20 minutes, and then it says, get sober. <laughs> secret. Oops. <laughs> oh, man, I just told the secret of me. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, and, and I can clearly remember one night where, um, uh, you know, I, I was drinking at home, and I got up to go to the bathroom, and I stumbled, and I almost fell. And I realized that I crossed that line into alcoholic, true alcoholic drinking. And it was almost as if, like, fuck, oh well. Okay? And then the pain got so bad that I wanted to stop drinking, and I couldn't. And I still, ha I still prayed, if you will. And I had gotten a, a, a DUI in this. This is one of the things that didn't get, happen to me the first go around, but here out drinking, I got a DUI really early on into after I'd started drinking again. You know, and, and, I'd, and I'd pray to my higher power that help me reach a bottom. But then I would negotiate. It's like, oh, please don't let me hurt anybody. Please don't let me get another dr drunk driving, you know. And, uh, and I also knew that the answer for me to get sober was to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to stop drinking, but you fuckers would expect me to stop drinking. I wanted to stop drinking, but Alcoholics Anonymous would expect me to stop drinking. And I think there's a, no, I don't think, I know darn well there's a brief little bit of me that thought I might be able to drink like a gentleman like I did that one particular time back in September of 2001, or whenever it was, right, that one night. Um, I can remember being out... It was a Saturday night, had dinner, I was at dinner by myself, I went to the neighborhood dive bar, and Tony was nuthouse, if anybody knows Palo Alto, um, and I see someone I knew from 25 years ago from Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, if you'll bear with me to take pizza, pizza uh, um, um, inventory, uh, I th assumed we read about him at the in in in, in um, uh, um, at the beginning of meetings, which is uh, and there are those two who, are, who suffer from grave and emotional and mental disorders, but they too have the capacity to stay sober if they stay honest with themselves. And uh, and you know Pete was a short yellow bus kind of guy, and I go up to see you know as I'm walking to the bathroom, Pete's there, and I go. Pete, are you still sober? And he looks at, at me, and how I remember it was, 25 years, motherfucker! <laughs> and, you know, he was an angry guy. You know, uh, I don't know if he actually said that, but he said 25 years. Okay? He goes, who are you? I go, and I'm drunk as hell. And it's like, Pete, you don't remember me, but I knew you back 25 years ago. Take me to a meeting. And uh, I give him my business card. And, uh, I, you know, I, I pee and I, I go back to the bar and, and, and I'm sitting there still nursing whatever, well, chugging down, slamming down whatever it was I was drinking. And Pete's on his way out and he goes, Mike, what are you doing? What lengths will you go to? And uh, I was like, man, you're harsh in my bus. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this is a Sunday morning. I woke up with a whole different attitude and it was oh my God, what if he calls? <laughs> and I was scared. 
you know, and, 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 and I, I hung on that Sunday till about 9 p.m. before I took a drink. And, and it couldn't last any longer than that. Monday, December 11th, 2011, December 12th, excuse me, 2011, I went to my first AA meeting back. And I haven't had to take a drink since then, by the grace of God and the fellowship. And I reworked these steps. Okay, I, it took me a while, but I was, I was, I was, I am, I am powerless over alcohol, and my life is unmanageable. Even today, it gets into these unmanageable phases. Okay, um, and then you know, I always believed in a higher power, and and. Here's a case where, by praying to it, he found the path to get me back into Alcoholics Anonymous. It wasn't another drunk driving. It wasn't hurting someone. It wasn't getting fired from work. It was putting someone in my in 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 front of me who I was surprised stays sober and embarrassed me enough that I hadn't. And I was the one who was suffering from a complete uh, not excuse me. Uh, emotional, grave emotional, um, uh, fill in the blank with the words. Because I wasn't being honest with myself, okay? Pete was fine. He'd stayed sober. He knew he was powerless. And I, and I wasn't. I wasn't being honest. I was certainly powerless. So, I made a decision to turn my will over to, uh, my, my, my will over to God again, okay? And somewhere around two year, Second year of sobriety, this go around, I started feeling sorry for myself, you know, and uh, in 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 uh, suicidal ideation was playing a major role in my in my mental outlook. And I went to this meeting, and this this lady who I had nothing in common with, and I wouldn't hang in the same social circles with, you know, if you remember back when. Um, that that young girl spoke. I had nothing in common with. Kind of moved me out out the door. Well, here's a lady sharing in a meeting, and she says she had suicidal thoughts, and she was scared to death because three of her two or three of her sisters had committed suicide, and she had turned her will and her life over to care of her God for drinking. Why not do that for the entire part of her life? And um, I'm a little goosebumpy right now because I can remember those same goosebumps in that meeting. And it got me off my ass and made me work some more steps because um, here's something from a person that I had nothing in common with. Share something that that resonated with me. Okay, and it's amazing. We 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 hear messages from folks in meetings that it, it's it's what you need to hear at that particular moment. Okay, I I don't know that that's going to happen in this hour, but um, you know, and and I did another another four step, okay, uh, and um, and I procrastinated, even though it's just a homework assignment, and all I have to do is write shit down, and it's all very familiar with it. I procrastinated, and the only way I could finish that four step was to stand in front of a men's meeting and say, I will finish my four-step by this particular date. And I've made a commitment. It's like you go to work and you, you commit to your boss that you're going to do something. That, I, I set my own deadline, and that's the only way I could fi fi um, finish my four-step. And I was meeting with my sponsor every Sunday after a, after a particular meeting. And, and I forgot to tell him that I was going to share my four-step with him. So here I am. I'm all, I'm all excited to share my fifth step. It's after the Sunday meeting. It's 10 a.m. He's like, dude, I got a tennis match in that half an hour. <laughs> so my only, my, only, my only recommendation on that, you know, I don't give suggestions, but let your sponsor know in advance that you're going to do the fifth step. <laughs> he did make time the following week. Um, and uh, six and seven, you know, I... I, I Still had those those character defects, um, and and they were as clear as ever. And you know, it talks about practicing these principles in all our affairs. 
And I can remember it was an issue at work. And I go up to my boss, and I can't remember quite what the, the story was, but, you know, I said, and I, and I shared that I had a fear around that. And he said, you better get over that. So my point is that not everybody understands the steps and the principles. And, and it, it, if, you're, if your boss is your sponsor and your sponsor is, a boss, is your boss, you probably need a new one. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, he, he certainly didn't understand me trying to share my feelings around getting a particular task at work done. So I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant these days on that. So thanks. Um, my list of amends were far less than what they were the first go around. Because you know I, I'd stopped stealing from my parents and stealing from everybody else. I had enough. <laughs> income from my job that I could afford my alcohol and all I did was isolate and drink for the most part you know there are friends who are concerned with me drinking and driving and and my amends to them are basically living amends today um, they know that I, I that tonight I won't get behind the wheel of a car drunk um, I certainly um, uh, embarrassed to the extent I would go to drive after drinking, and um, fortunate I never hurt anybody. A um, couple years into sobriety, this this go around. Um, I guess this is 2013 or so. My mom passed away. I got to put a two-year chip in her in her when when I buried her. So it was. 20 some years apart, but I put a one year chip in my mom's, um, in my dad's casket and a two year chip in my mom's. And so it was um, getting to make those amends was important to me. Okay. And even if, if, if people you owe amends to, if people I, I owe amends to are not alive, I can write my amends out, you know, and I can share it with my sponsor and, and we can decide what to do with that, that that list, you know, whether I burn it and be all dramatic or just, you know, accept that the fact that I, I have amended my behavior and I, you know, and I can't apologize in person to someone who's passed, that's, that's okay. Um, ten step. Oh, I'll back up. There was one amends that I, I had to make and it was to, uh, um, I didn't know how to do this. Uh, it was to, um, I, I'm, I'm hesitant because about sharing some grandiose amends, but it was to the Stanford Blood Bank, okay? When I was drinking and doing drugs, I, drinking, I wasn't doing drugs, sorry. Um, you know, I, I felt so, like a, such a piece of shit that I'd go donate blood. Oh. And part of the questions are, have you ever used intravenous needles? Oh, I guess I was doing drugs. And I wrote, no, uh, but I had been. Have you ever had sex with a man? Well, uh, no. You know, I'd uh, put another man's penis in my mouth for cocaine. Yeah. And I lie on this, okay? And uh, I didn't know how to make amends to the Stanford Blood Bank on this. And it's funny, I just share this with my sponsor. There's someone else in the program who works for the Stanford Blood Bank. You know, it's amazing how these things come full circle. She mentions to her management why I need to come in and come clean. So uh, uh, they were concerned that they were going to have to go notify anybody who received my blood that it was possibly tainted. Instead, I had to go have my blood tested and I was clean. And they thanked me for having come forward. So it's amazing how um, when, when you make amends, the, the, the sense of relief others might have. That was a tough one. Um, tenth step. At the end of the day, I don't do this religiously. Um, you know, for the longest time, I misunderstood the tenth step, or at least a good portion of it. 
I know almost immediately if I fuck up and I owe someone an apology. Okay, the the the, the feeling I get, you know, is instantaneous. Okay, um, as, I'll give you an example. I'm driving down the freeway, and I know this guy's going to change cut cutting lanes. I can speed up and block him. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really make me feel all that fantastic. Or I can I can back off the 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 throttle off the accelerator, let them in, and my my current sponsor says change the narrative on that. Say, oh my gosh, I hope he gets to I hope his family's okay and I hope he gets there safely, okay? Because here's there's a reason he has to be speedy. Change the narrative and make sure that his he's going okay. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with my God. On my way to work, um, I walk to the train station and, and, and take the train down to the South Bay. And I, I don't, I don't meditate in a uh, sit and be quiet kind of thing. I just sit and I talk, I, I, I talk to my God as I'm walking, and I say, "Thank you for giving me a wonderful life. Thank you for keeping me clean and sober." And then I start praying for people, you know. Uh, Give them the life that they they desire, okay. And at the end of that, I ask that I help somebody today, because Tommy referred to that. I think that's the only thing that I have to offer is to try and help someone today. Not always successful, and I don't. And even if I am, I don't need to know that I would help someone. If if I do that, if, if I, then it gets into the, back into this ego thing that. I only helped you so that I would feel better about myself or something. Or that you would feel better about me. If I help someone, it's just, I hope I hope they get something, some benefit from me being around them. And, uh, you know, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, I get to carry the message to other alcoholics. I didn't save you too much time tonight. Maybe four or five minutes. <laughs> Anyway, I'm Mike. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.